Well, I guess we'd better concentrate on finding a nice Christmas tree. I suggest we try those searchlights, Charlie Brown. This really brings Christmas clothes to a person. Fantastic. Charlie Brown, remember what Lucy said? This doesn't seem to fit the modern spirit. I don't care. We'll decorate it, and it'll be just right for our play. Besides, I think it needs me. We're back. You're hopeless, Charlie Brown. Completely hopeless. Rats! You've been dumb before, Charlie Brown, but this time you really did it. <laughs> what a treat! <laughs> I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Um, grab it up. My name is Danielle. My pronouns are she, her. And um, when Ben asked me to speak for a few minutes for short reflection on these verses from Luke, I just couldn't resist having Linus do the reading because how can you how can you resist Linus? Now I don't know if you if this is something that you grew up with, the Charlie Brown Christmas, but I did. So I thought I'd share a little bit of my answer to the story, the question from before. Take you back to Christmas 1982. That's what I look like under the tree. New Jersey, you can see somebody got a uh, tape cassette uh, holder for Christmas. It's been opened behind me. And in my family, back in the early 80s, you know, before DVDs and all, all that kind of stuff, we used to, our tradition was we had all these videotapes that we'd add to with the new Christmas specials that came out every year. And so you, you had tape one, two, and three. And um, Charlie Brown Christmas was on it. There was a Ziggy Christmas. Do you know who Ziggy is? Um, there was a whole bunch of them that were on there. And so I remember those kind of Christmas uh, cartoons with like all the ad breaks in them and like where they've been messily chopped in and out and um, yeah, super, super grainy, square format. And um, one of the big controversies of my childhood was that my dad taped wrestling over one of our Christmas <laughs> Christmas tapes. And he still has not been forgiven, so like he still gets mentioned on a fairly regular basis. Um, so that was that was my little taste of my 1980s childhood. If you can identify with that at all, some of you are probably like, what are you even talking about? I thought about even bringing in a 
video cassette just in case anyone had not seen it. <laughs> so just a little refresher that Linus, this is, this is the reading that Linus um, shared as part of his explaining to Charlie Brown what Christmas was all about. And it's the story of the shepherds um, being greeted by the angels and being given the big news about the baby being born. And um, it's from the Gospel of Luke. And it struck me, you know, you might be wondering, what does Daniel talk about clearing Charlie Brown in Christmas? What, what could that possibly be about? Um, and I, I've kind of fallen in love a bit with this term clearing and what it means. Um, for me, well, for me, clearing, clearing means, our sacred story, clearing our sacred stories means holding them, even those we, we love, with a loose enough grasp to be able to see and experience them more fully and more truthfully. We allow ourselves to see the grit and the glitter, and we center the marginalized in our stories. We use our full selves, our intellect, our experience, our spirituality, and our imagination. We're curious and unafraid of questions, even if they disrupt things for ourselves and for others. So, I mean, this idea of queering, you know, in queer theory and in liberation theology, a lot of it is about um, look, seeing queer sexuality and gender in the stories, but it's also about that invitation that queer people do so well of taking a second look, taking a deeper look, um, studying, looking what historians have said in the past, bringing together all those pieces of knowledge, but also that beautiful, creative, prophetic imagination that queer communities often have to be able to recognize things in the story that maybe have been missed before. And so for me, I was thinking, thinking about that in relationship to both the Gospel of Luke, but also to Charlie Brown. <laughs> so the shepherds, the shepherds were, the, were, the, were the, the heart of the story that was being read by, by Linus. And um, I did a little bit of digging into that story, because I know, like, if you're, if you're like my family, we had always out, like, a nativity set that had all the cast of characters there, the shepherds and, and the, the magi or the wise men, everybody there at the same time. So. That visual is quite strong in making you think, oh, this is all part of the same story. But actually, um, there are four different versions of the Gospels, the life of, life of Jesus told from different perspectives for different people. And um, the, the Magi, the, the wise men, only appear in the Gospel of Matthew. In Luke's Gospel, the story is focused around um, the shepherds. And also, in Luke, Luke's Gospels, in a lot of ways, a really female story, it really centers Mary, Mary in her, in her life and in her experience. Um, so also, I think in churches around the world, there can be this real tendency to kind of play off the shepherds against the magi, the rich and the poor, the outcast, um, the kings, and to see the shepherds as the kind of impure people that are coming into the same situation. But what I found really interesting was the idea of the heavenly host appearing to the shepherds and the shepherds were actually like it was a pretty um it was a humble profession but also like a respected profession it was you think they, uh, jesus was born in bethlehem he's part of the line of king david who was what a shepherd and so the visiting of the shepherds to the baby jesus and bringing that that story to them of what they've seen and heard is harkening back to the line of shepherds and that humble, humble procession, profession, uh, Rebecca, Rachel, Moses, and David. And then, of course, we see later on in some of the other Gospels, Jesus being referred to as the shepherd himself, the good shepherd. Um, we can picture these shepherds and under the stars. They're doing what people do at the end of the day, telling stories, singing songs, praying to God for good health, or for the Romans to go away, talking about household troubles or joys. Um, perhaps the women come on the shepherds are gathering to tell their own stories and share their dreams. And the angel offers them good news. And that that idea of good news comes from that root evangelion. Even I'm a singer, right? Evangelion. evangelion. Um, which is a reference to the good news that we often hear like about gospel mission. But here it is declared out at the very birth of Christ. The good news begins at the start of Jesus' life. And it's even that phrase is kind of, um, the, the readers in Luke would have been really uh, familiar with it from the good news of like the God of Augustus Caesar being declared in their communities. And now here the writer of Luke is kind of riffing on it to make it a spiritual declaration um, that goes beyond the, the, the political and, and, and but yet still touches upon it. 
Um, so, my friend Amy Jo Levine, who is, well, she's not really my friend, I did talk to her once. I'd like to think she's my friend. Um, <laughs> she, she, she's a, a Jewish um, Bible scholar who pretty much anything that I, that I, that I speak on, I look to see if she said something because she's not a Christian, um, but she brings this richness of the Jewish experience and Jewish history and Jewish um, culture to her understanding of the, of the text. And I love what she said here. She says, the shepherds don't see a baby that glows in the dark or one fully, fully verbal or even with one complete set of teeth. They see the baby snuggled in his wrappings there is nothing particularly special about what their eyes see. There is everything special about how they interpret what they see. When we see the shepherds, we see Luke express another concern. Jesus himself needs angels less than he needs these people. He wants the human companionship, and he wants humanity to be more like companions, able to fully love their neighbors. I love that. For me, one of the reasons that I hang on to my faith in Christ is the humanity, the flesh of Jesus. And that that is even coming in at this part of the story. I, and Amy, this, I stole this from Amy Jill as well. But the idea of Mary being this like 14 year old girl, having given birth in a stable, just done it, and then shepherds come in with this news. She's like, I think that was really thoughtful of God to not make Amy go through a whole other angelic visitation that she's just given birth. And I thought, yeah, actually, so to me, that's a little bit of a queer reading on this, like that, that imagination to think. Wow, God allowed that message to come to her of something angelic and beautiful, but through these human beings that came into the picture. And, you know, I can just imagine Mary, you know, with all the hormones and all the things going on. Did that really happen? Am I imagining this? Am I imagining this story? And yet she has these witnesses come in who say and confirm to both her and to Joseph, actually, yeah, this is happening. This thing that you thought that you were told was true. And um, to me, that's a really beautiful, earthy, human moment in the midst of like the birthing room <laughs> and, and all these, these folks coming in from their, from their really human, earthy work. Um, so back to Charlie Brown. I'm a little bit fascinated with Charlie Brown, and I wonder if, like, I can't quite imagine Charlie Brown's Christmas making it to the airwaves today. This is quite a melancholy little, little guy, isn't he? And um, I love how in Charlie Brown's Christmas, he's really himself. He gets down and, and hurt and, and stuff, but like he hangs on to this idea of what Christmas should be about and he rejects the kind of consumerism that he, that he sees around him, even to his cost. And then, you know, it hurts him when his friends make fun of him. I actually cut out some of the mocking from that video because I couldn't take it. It goes on for a really long time. It's really shocking to my modern ears how mean his friends are to him. Um, but, you know, this is the way I think Charlie Brown queers Christmas. He peels away the layers. He allows himself, his true self, to be seen. Um, and I love this quote from um, Father uh, Stephen Copeland, who's a Franciscan, who wrote about the spirituality of Charlie Brown. He says, Charlie Brown, chooses a small, humble, frail, beautiful, unassuming twig of a tree that perfectly resembles his own humanity. He chooses the simple, the obscure, to decorate. He chooses authenticity. He chooses realness. He says, besides, I think it needs me. He's a true contemplative. Charlie Brown leans into the melancholy. And thank God for Linus being a good friend, right? He's the only decent human being that seems to be enough for a scene. Um, <laughs> But like the Christmas story, the original Christmas story that we all know about Jesus' birth, and all really true Christmas story, I don't mean just factually true, I mean deeply true, that, the whole that deep truth. They're all, they all lean into humanity and the cost of being human and of being ourselves, despite the circumstances around us. And for those of us who believe in the truth of the Christmas story, the incredible bittersweet nature of God taking on flesh and being born into this life, the beauty of really, glorious and often painful life that we and that we need to seek joy and be joy wherever we can. So thank you for that. I'm just going to share the closing part of this story to give us a little bit of joy. Enjoy. I'll take this little tree home and decorate it and I'll show them it really will work in our play. Oh well, 
This commercial dog is not going to ruin my Christmas. I've killed it. Oh, everything I catch gets ruined. never thought it was such a bad little tree. It's not bad at all, really. Maybe it just needs a little love. Charlie Brown is a blockhead, but he did get a nice tree. What's going on here?